Good morning, Pearl Church. We're so happy to see you this morning. Why don't you stand? We're going to enter into worship this morning. And welcome to everyone online as well. Wherever you find yourself, we're so glad to have you with us. Um, so why don't we pray really quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the rain or the sun, Lord. We are grateful for the weather. Father, we thank you that we can gather together, Lord, in person, Father, and in spirit to worship you, Lord, to gather in community, Father, to know you more, Lord. We are so grateful. We are so thankful, Father, for your spirit that it is with us, Lord, in every moment of the day, God. We give you this morning. We give you this week, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Creation, creation. 
consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you we want you oh come and consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you we want you stop we can't live without you come on sing it out we love you we love you and we can't get enough all this is for you
Amen. The goodness of God comes running after us. Beautiful picture in the Old Testament talks about it out of Deuteronomy that it wants to tackle us. It wants to overtake us. What a beautiful thing. We're at the table of the Lord here this morning. Uh, once a month we come together corporately to take communion together. You know, Paul talks about the revelation that the Lord gave to him after the Lord had returned to heaven. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, I'm going to put up a, a verse here for us. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. You know, it's funny, on the night that, of betrayal, one of the most difficult times that he was going to have on the earth, and yet he says, it comes to mind that we need to have communion. He would later be arrested and go through the process of the Garden of Gethsemane and the courts, but he says, you know, I'm going to institute this, even amongst one that will betray me. He says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and uh, said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took up the cup of the, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then I want to uh, put your eyes on this verse, verse 26. And it says this, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim. That word is a, is a word uh, used to, uh, in declaring a king, in announcing the arrival of a king, a conquest, the victory. And when we take communion, we are proclaiming a conquest. We are proclaiming a victory. We are declaring Jesus Christ as the ultimate king of kings, where he defeated on the cross, not just defeated Satan, but he took he hold of the keys of, of hell and death. And he triumphed openly against all the opposition. There is victory found in Jesus Christ, and we bring communion together. We take the bread and we bring the wine. We're proclaiming his death. It's the ultimate conquest. It's the victory that you and I have. And who do we declare it to? Well, we declare it to ourselves. I don't know what your week was like or the month was like, but I know in my own heart there are times I have to say, hold it now. I need to proclaim the victory of Jesus Christ. I need to put my attention on what he has done for me, for, for healing, for restitution, for reconciliation, for restoration, revival. I need to declare to myself the victory of Christ. But I also need to proclaim it, it says, to those around us, including the spiritual authorities that we deal with on a regular basis. We are proclaiming Christ's victory there on the cross of Calvary. So I don't know what you're dealing with today. But there is a greater conquest. There's a greater victory that's found in Jesus Christ. And we come to the table of the Lord. We are reminding ourselves what side we're on. We're on the winning side, amen. Sin has been dealt with. We have forgiveness. We have reconciliation. But we also have the power through the blood of Jesus Christ. Two beautiful emblems. The first, the bread. The bread representing the body of Christ there on the cross of Calvary in our place, in our stead. There, by his stripes, we can find healing, we can find provision, but he also took our place. Instead of the wrath of God coming against us, he took it on for himself. Let's remember this today. Let's take the bread. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for every one of us, Lord, we thank you. It wasn't just your blood that was poured out, it was your body broken that we might have healing and we might have restoration in our body, our mind, our soul, Lord. Every facet of life coming into full order. Lord, for the depression, oh God, for the anxiety, for the stress, for the fear, Lord, we take it captive right now in the name of Jesus and we walk in the freedom and liberty that you bought for us there on the cross. And then he took up the cup. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's a covenant of grace. It's a covenant that, that is not a, by our works, it's by the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the blood is there today for you and I. Let's take together of the cup. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that not only have we forgiveness, but we have forgiveness available every day. Lord, it says that if we will confess our sins, you are just and able, oh God, just and able to forgive us of our, clean, our sins and cleanse us of all our iniquity. So God, we thank you. Guilt and shame has no hold on us, no power on us, Lord. We wake up to the newness of God, the mercies of God that are new every day. So God, we thank you today for the beautiful bread and the wine. We lift it up and we proclaim Jesus is King of Kings. There is none other. There is none other higher than Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we declare, we thank you for your victory in your name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Let's 
Father, we just thank you today, Lord, that you are having a word for us. You want to speak to us. You want to encourage us. God, we just want to be in your presence. God, we realize, Lord, that the presence, oh, God, changes everything. God, it changes our marriages. It changes our homes. God, it'll change, oh, Lord, the pathways that we walk on because, oh, God, we, we become tuned into you and your directions. We, we need the presence, Lord. God, we don't just need a gathering. God, we don't just need some social activity. We need the presence of God to come. Where, God, we become like that woman who came into the house and we poured out that alabaster box and began to anoint you. No one else did that. But, God, we want to do that because we value the presence of God. So right now, Lord, we give you space. We say, come and speak to us. Encourage us. Come and do whatever you need to do in our hearts and our lives, our homes and our marriages, because, God, your presence changes everything. 
And everyone said, amen. Praise God. Why don't you be seated or wave at least somebody. Somebody new to say, thumbs up. Great to have you here this morning. Great to be in the presence of the Lord. Man, I love our worship team. Man, I just love, I just love just sitting in and just relaxing, enjoying, pressing in. Um, love the worship, love the worship. Well, it's great to be in the house here this morning. And I just want to encourage you with a couple of announcements before we hit to the word of the Lord. I want to remind you that we continue to make available opportunities for you to give your tithes and offerings, which according to the word of God gives us not only a, an opportunity to worship God in our finances, but it opens up our finances to God where we say, God, I'll surrender to you through this act of tithing and offering where God, I, I say, God, I invite you into my finances to uh, guide me, to lead me even in this realm. And it's amazing how we want God in every realm of our life, but often Let's not talk about finances, but yet finances are spoke about more in the word of God than even heaven and hell. So that tells us that the Lord puts emphasis on that. Well, you can do that through our website. You can do that for the church uh, center app that we now have as you register and you become part of it. So make note of that. Uh, a couple other announcements we want to just let you know. Uh, we, we are constantly uh, enjoying opportunity to pray where you uh, uh, give us what it is that you're going through and we pray for you and we encourage you and uh, uh, let us know we do have prayer after the service here that you can come down to the front and some of the leaders will join with you and pray with you uh, social distancing of course but we also want to hear from you whether you're in person or online how can we pray for you we believe prayer makes a difference another announcement we do want to have mother's day is coming up and on the saturday before mother's day we're doing a diaper drive for Terra house Terra House is a great organization that uh, uh, helps particularly, um, though not only, um, young moms, uh, single moms, and uh, we want to just bless them with diapers, something simple, but you know, sometimes it's the basic things that they need the most. Uh, so they do have uh, social programs and other things to help them out, but we want to just do a diaper drive. So Saturday at Westminster School, uh, information is going out to the neighborhood already through the mail that they'll just remind them uh, that they can do this at 2 o'clock till 4 o'clock at Westminster on Saturday. If you would like to be part of that team that receives the diapers, collects them, and then just blesses the community, please come see myself or Sarah. We'd love to have you be a part of that, just two hours and take a rotation. But then on the, on the Sunday, when we gather together, bring your diapers in. Bring the diapers in, bring the boxes in, the bags in, whatever it is, and we're just going to load up and we're going to bless the Terra House or finances if you want to give that. So that's that. But then we're doing on the 16th, the following Sunday, we're doing a uh, plant giveaway. Don Scott, and uh, really I have to commend his wife and encourage her too because she allowed them to do this in their home. Uh, 250 plants or so of herbs and tomato plants that we just want to give away to the community. And uh, I believe what it's going to be is a start for next year to be a plant swap where the community comes in. They have extras, and let's just build community around plants, all right? So uh, we're going to uh, give this out on the, t on the 16th, but we need a few people to help us set up, and we're going to do it at this school and uh, give them an opportunity to come and pick it up. And so, again, that information is going out to the community. We're advertising it, so we're looking forward to building in our community. Amen. So we're rooting for them. Ha, ha, ha. And that's what we're doing there. And uh, so continue to connect with one another during this time. It's a little difficult. We do have Zoom classes going on with our Bible study. Uh, but uh, there are other people that are get, gathering together through Zoom. Do what you can as we have these new conditions. Um, it will break soon. All right. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not a train. All right. Some of you got that. All right. Uh, we're finishing off our series called This Is Us, the study in the book of Ephesians. If you haven't been with us, there's about, this is the ninth one. And uh, Paul is writing this uh, letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, which is really not just a, a letter to the church at Ephesus. It's a church for you and I. And that's why we called it This Is Us. When we read the book of Ephesians, uh, we don't just put our mind back to what Paul is doing to the church at, at Ephesus in the first century, but it's a, a word inspired by God for you and I today. Chapters 1 through, three, 1 through 3 is dealing with our belief systems, who we are in Christ. He uses that phrase, in Christ, repeatedly, 36 times. And we are now in Christ. But then our beliefs have to match up to our behavior. And that's chapters 4 to 6. And we went through the behavior as Christians, how we should be acting, no longer like the world. We don't have the grave clothes on. We don't have this death attitude anymore where we resemble the walking dead. We are alive in Christ, so we have to behave like 
we're alive in Christ. So we put off the old man and we put on the new man. Well, there were so many things in that. I just don't have time to really do a uh, rewind and uh, bring a review on that. We're, we're heading into uh, this beautiful passage that is perhaps well known by many people talking about the armor of God. Now, let's understand that Paul is speaking to uh, uh, the church at Ephesus that's under the Roman regime, the dominion of the Roman Empire. All right, which it is constantly, uh, you see the soldiers everywhere, there's battle fatigues, there is declaration of the Roman rule, and uh, Rome just doesn't want to invade nations and cities, but it wants to invade homes and marriages and into the families. It it, it would hold up its political and dominion, uh, military might, uh, and it would would come in to control believers, not just invade them, but wants to oppress and dictate their lives. Well, for believers, we, we have the same thing. And what Paul does is he lifts this scenario and brings it into the spiritual realm for you and I as believers. And we read this uh, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of darkness of this age, and against uh, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I want to just remind you that we do post the notes and the scriptures up on our website. Uh, If you ever want to catch these and follow them later and uh, watch or just do your own personal study because uh, sometimes we go through a little bit of information as we're doing this book study, which uh, we we only do a couple times a year, but uh, really felt it was important. But before he talks about this great passage of the armor of God that we all grew up with, maybe we went to Sunday school with, we all got to wear the plastic armor and uh, got to be that guy that the teacher would use as, as an example and uh, we love that sword and after too many uses of that plastic sword it would just wobble back and forth blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we never really have any power to it but Paul before he gets to this armor of God Paul lays down the necessity of it the reason for it the importance of it he wants to get a hold of your heart and my heart that we understand that the armor is for a reason and the reason is there is a battle going on the battle is real. Just because you don't want to admit it doesn't mean it goes away. Just because you don't want to talk about it doesn't mean there isn't a battle. Just because you think, hey, nobody really thinks it's serious doesn't mean that it isn't happening. The armor of God, Paul making it very clear, is not for some glibly, whimsically, hey, let's just think about the armor for a while. Let's just wear it more like for a fashion statement. Paul is saying, you've got to understand that the armor of God is important because the battle is real. Daily, as soon as you accept Christ and come into the kingdom of God, there is a battle on. Paul writes in Colossians, and he says this in 113, For he, God, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. There is two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of darkness. There's a kingdom of light. There's a kingdom that is under satanic, demonic rule. And there's another kingdom that's the kingdom of light, of Jesus Christ. There is two kingdoms and there's a clash. He rescued us. Salvation came, redeemed us. He rescued us out of one kingdom. And that kingdom is fighting to get us back. He's fighting to get a hold of souls, trying to keep you and I from fulfilling our destiny. There is an enemy that is real, and the battle is real. And yet too many believers, when they enter into the kingdom of God, they enter the kingdom of God more on a tourist visa. It's like, oh, this is great, a new kingdom. Oh, man, I love the people. They're so happy. Hey, maybe I'll participate in some fellowship and some games and some activities and get to social club, and all of a sudden, I'm just going to enjoy this new foreign land that I'm in. But when we come into this kingdom, it is not a kingdom where we are tourists. We are soldiers. We come into a kingdom where time and time again, the Bible, from Old Testament pictures that are drawn into fulfillment in the New Testament, we find we're soldiers, we're battling, we are warring a warfare against an enemy. And yet too many believers, 
don't believe that the, the, the life in the kingdom that there can be a battle. No, Jesus did it all. I don't have to do anything. I can just sit back and enjoy all the battle that Jesus did. I don't have to worry about it. And even Christians, solid believing Christians, have missed this one part where they don't believe that there is a, really a battle going on. Did you know 62%, I know of Americans, okay, it's skewed already, 62% of Americans polled say that Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil. It's just a symbol. That's all it is. It has no power. It has no abilities. There's nothing to Satan. Satan's just a symbol of evil. Two-thirds of Americans don't believe that the devil is a living entity. No, no, it's just something, something out there. You know what? The greatest trick of the devil, listen to me, the greatest trick of the devil that he's ever pulled is convincing the world that he doesn't exist. Because if he doesn't exist in your mind and you don't pay attention, he can do whatever he wants. He can pull the strings from behind. He can be a puppet master. He can be one that is, that is infiltrating your heart and your life and your family and your children with, with, with attacks. And you go, well, there is no devil. That's just the world system. And all of a sudden, he stands back and he laughs. And he goes, this is great. Because if they don't believe I'm real, I can do whatever I want. The devil's real. The battles are real. And listen to me. Souls lay in the balance. Because if you don't believe there's a devil, you don't believe there's a hell. And if you don't believe there's hell, there's no reason to evangelize. There's no reason to tell anybody else about Jesus because you know what? It's all going to work out in the end. There is nobody evil behind it. There's not a Satan. There's not a hell. We don't have to worry about the judgment of God. Heaven and hell, but also, can I tell you, the devil, when we step through salvation and redemption into a right relationship with God, you go, well, that's it. The devil just leaves you alone. No, he will hinder you from fulfilling the purposes of God that God has for you. The destiny as a man of God, as a woman of God, as somebody that God calls you to and gifts you and puts his presence on you and uses you in this world to make a difference, all of a sudden the devil says, well, I will just cause some chaos, some confusion, some doubt, some despair, some stress, and I will cause that person not to fulfill their calling. So the, we are constantly in this battle. And Paul says we need to be, it says this, we need to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. No, it's okay, God, I got this. Yeah, I know he's real, but I got this. And, and Paul is saying, you ain't got this. The worst thing you can do is think that you can handle Satan on your own, that you have the power. That, oh, I've been going to church long enough. I know all the worship songs. I know a couple of hymns off by heart. Man, I can sing my way through this. No, you can't. Because if you're doing this in your own might, you will fail. Paul says, you've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Paul is trying to set you up to get you to know this is a real battle. There is something going on that you can't just do this on your own. You've got to be able to stand that position of victory. And the only way to do that is you've got to go in with the strength of God and the power of his might. So lay down your earthly weapons. Lay down what you think you can do. And you've got to pick up what is spiritual what Paul talks about, the armor of God and the weaponry that God has, but you've got to stand in the power of his might. You know, Paul tells us that the battles and the warfare that we deal with every day, he says clearly, it is not flesh and blood. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, you know, we'll put this figure up. We'll put this politician up. We'll put this ruler up. We'll put this person making laws. We go, that is our problem. No, that is not your problem. If you think that's your problem, you're missing the battle because the battle is behind the flesh and blood. It is not the flesh and blood. We think it's some sort of political, social, uh, uh, legal, cultural, uh, uh, different opinions and ideologies that are out there and just new ways of thinking. We think that that's a philosophy. Everybody's arguing. There's hatred. There's, there's intolerance, cancel culture. And we pick one of these things. We go, that's the problem. No, it's what's behind it that is the problem. The source of all this stuff that we think is in the realm of flesh and blood, it's behind. It's a spiritual battle that is going on. We struggle, but it's not in those things because there's a real enemy. And the Bible makes it clear we war on three fronts. Every one of us, we war on three fronts. Number one, we, we, we war against the world. 
the world and its, its systems and, and its ideologies and its philosophies that it has, which it did not birth by itself. There's somebody else that is pulling the strings. It's the puppeteer, as it were. But, but John makes it, makes it clear that all that's in the world that is not of God, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, that is of the world. And he says you can't love the world and love God. Why? Because your heart can't be in two places loving two different masters. So, but the world says, love the world, love the world, love the world. And we've got to so know that the world is not our friend. The world is not for us. It is against us. So, so we deal with the world, but we also deal with the flesh, and that is that Adamic nature in us. That Adam, that, that, that sinfulness, that desire, propensity to do things our own way. To say, God, I, I can rule myself. I don't need you. Where we make choices based on selfishness, our own, our own flesh and our carnal ways, that sin nature, that tendency to do things for ourselves that drive us and put us first. But then there's that third realm that really is behind it all, and that's the demonic, the satanic and demonic realm. And some of you just rolled your eyes. It's like I'm speaking about UFOs and aliens. It is real, people. The Bible makes it very, very clear to us that there is an enemy Paul says we're to stand against, and it says the wiles or the scheming of the devil. And one of the greatest deceptions, again, is the, of the devil is to not believe he really makes a difference in your life, that you don't have to worry about him. And Paul says everything that we taught went through from chapters 1 through 5, and the first part of chapter 6, our relationships, everything, the enemy wants to steal from you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take your beliefs that don't match up to your behavior. That you can believe something, but you don't do it. And the enemy wants to eradicate what God is trying to work in your heart and your life. But Paul calls him out. Our enemy is not flesh and blood, not the flesh we see, the bodies that move around, the governments, the politicians, the things that we're critical about, that we have our conversations about, that we're always talking about these leaders in such a negative way and all the systems, are, and we're just putting our attention on these things. And it's like Paul says, stop. Stop giving your energy and resources to, to those battles because that's not the battle. The battle is not the people, the system, the ideology that everybody's ranting about. It's, it's really not racism, injustice, and financial oppression and the prevalence of immorality. Those are symptoms of something that's behind. And what's behind is the satanic move that will do whatever it can to ruin the creation to ruin the purposes of God, to ruin the unity, to ruin the, the, the flow of God's grace in the earth. There is a sinister spirit at work behind it all. It's not your spouse. It's not your in-laws. Get over it. There is something behind it all. It's not flesh and blood. So stop throwing your money, your resources, and energies trying to change it. It's a spiritual problem. That enemy is trying to sow seeds of disunity. And right now, if you've got disunity in your heart, if you've got some anger and some bitterness against some person, and you go, no, this battle's flesh and blood. Man, I just can't wait to get a hold of that person. I'm just going to just tear a strip out of them, and I'm just going to lay into them. They're not the problem. There is a spiritual problem bringing disunity and bitterness. And you've got to pray. You've got to fast. You seek God. You pull in scriptures and you realize they're not my problem. My problem, the battle that I have is, is spiritual. Paul tells us that the enemy is strategic. He is scheming. He is a schemer. He's a planner. And he comes and he's trying not just to do you harm. And, and he forms a strategy. He knows you many times better than you know yourself because you know what? He knows your weaknesses, your deficiencies, your attitudes. He knows the areas where you're the weakest. And he comes and he sows seeds into those. He's a good fisherman who doesn't just know where the fish are. He knows how to bait the fish. He knows what it is in your life that he can touch and draw you in to cause you to sin or bring, bring that, that carnal spell to happen in your life. He's scheming. And let me just tell you, he's studying you. He's knowing what's going on. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent, but he studies. So he knows. He's studying you. He's studying your marriage. He's studying your family. Why? So he can put a wedge inside. He can bring up an attitude. He can bring up a, a, an anger, a, a lust, a, a, some hurtful word that all of a sudden he gets a foothold, and by that foothold, he begins to 
put himself in as a wedge. And I'll tell you what, there is an enemy that's going after the next generation like never before. And that's why it's so important we realize the enemy is going after the next generation, the seed, the, the godly seed. He's coming in to bring division and, and, and bring distraction, bring discouragement into their hearts and lives to uh, thwart and pl the plans and purposes of, of God for those children. So we've got to know the battle is real. He wants to take advantage of your weaknesses and your fears. He knows your anxieties. Why is it that all of a sudden that very thing that you're afraid of seems to come up in your mind every once in a while? It's like, where did that come from? Well, that's the enemy. And the enemy uses people to speak things in other areas to, 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 as it were, get your goat. He wants to take advantage. And I tell you what, when, when I begin to realize that the enemy is scheming after my marriage and after my children, there's a holy indignation that rises up in me. And all of a sudden, I begin to see the handprints of the enemy in certain situations, and I go, devil, not today. You want a battle? We're going to war. And all of a sudden, my wife and I, over a situation, all of a sudden, from our, our, our regular prayer life, we're in combat zone. We are praying. We are rescuing. We are doing whatever we can to put a protection of lair around our children because we're saying we are the gatekeepers of those children right now, so we are going to go to war for them, and we fight for them. We call down scriptures over them. We are praying for the next generation. The battle is real. Paul helps us understand this battle. He says in Ephesians 6.12, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen realm, against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Paul's doing his best to set the stage for us. Listen, it's not some devil in a red suit with a pitchfork and a bouncing tail, and all of a sudden he's going around doing a little mischief. Well, that's the devil. It's just a caricature, a cartoon, a figment of our imagination. We just come up with some way to describe what evil's really about. No. He even comes in, it says, as angels of light. He disguises himself. Genesis, he came in as a serpent. He comes into our lives, and we don't see him coming, and he comes in to bring chaos into our lives. He's real. And the devil does come to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus comes to bring life and life more abundant. So we choose the ways of God, and we begin to pray those things over our children and over our marriages. You know, Jesus said, we read about him and how he went into the wilderness after his baptism in Luke 4. And there he was confronted with the enemy, with the devil. And the temptations began to come against uh, Jesus. And Jesus began to uh, quote scripture, even though Satan misquoted scripture. Jesus quotes scripture back at him until finally it says the enemy left him for a more opportune time. He knew the devil was coming back. The devil was going to come back, but he was able to fight against him. He wants to hinder Jesus from his uh, mission, from, from his purposes, and the enemy comes to you and I to do the very same thing. The book of Genesis, the enemy comes in and he tempts Adam and Eve, what? To doubt God, then to disobey God, and to believe that they could run their lives better on their own. Is the, has the enemy tricked you to believe some area of your life you can do better without doing it God's way? Think about it. What area do you go, well, hey, God, I love your word, but this one area, I'm not really into it. I don't see it being applicable to my life. You know, I'm not really one of those kind of people. And yet the Bible tells us that. But we can be deceived to believe some area we can do it on our own. And Paul's telling us, in, or Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and be sober. The enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. We all have an enemy and he ain't a putty cat. Oh, just some nice little kitty cat. No, he's, he's a roaring lion. He's going about wanting to devour. He's stalking us. He's, he's on the prowl. How can he get a hold of you in your workplace where all of a sudden somebody walks by and it gets your attention. You look at them once, that's okay, but twice, all of a sudden, now you're going down a path. How does the enemy all of a sudden cause you to give up an area of maybe trusting God in your finances and you're going to hold on to this and all of a sudden God says, hey, I, I had something waiting for you, but you held back. But the enemy put it in your heart, no, I can do it better myself. There are so many ways the enemy comes and prowls after us. So be alert. Be of sober mind. Treat it like it's serious, Paul says. I cannot apologize this morning for being serious about this. I have seen too many believers, and can I tell you, too many Christian leaders. 
that are no longer in the ministry because they did not treat the battle seriously. Whether they have fallen morally, areas of, of depression, areas of, of anxiety, they, they've walked away because they've lost the passion, they've gotten hard-hearted, something drew them away. All of a sudden, why? Because they did not consider the battle. It's real. Paul says it's not with flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age, uh, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Just because it's invisible or unseen doesn't mean it's not real. Paul says the things that are unreal, that are invisible, are more real. They are more significant in our life than just the things we see. You can't afford to ignore it. Now, we don't fear it. I don't fear the battle. I know Jesus Christ is one. Cross of Calvary, there has been the greatest victory, the greatest conquest ever in all of battles where Jesus took hold of heaven and, and uh, uh, or hell, the keys to death and the keys to hell and grabbed hold of those things. And all of a sudden we have the victory. Jesus dealt the final blow to Satan on the cross of Calvary. He's defeated, going to be cast into the lake of fire. He just has this season. It says that he's been loosed for a season. He's like a dog on a leash. And God has granted him authority for a season, a certain realm of authority that he can bring deception and he can cause there to be some havoc going on in our lives. He doesn't have full ability, but he opposes the purposes of God in the earth, and that's where you and I battle daily. We are fighting in something, and it's a war not against flesh and blood. Satan, the prince of darkness, his principalities, powers, rulers, they have one goal in mind, disrupt the redemptive purposes in the earth. Disrupt the redemptive purposes, which includes your calling, your gifting, how God wants you to be used to evangelize your neighbor, your friends, your family, to use you to pray for people. He wants to come and instill fear. James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. And he tells us, walk in submission to God, be obedient to God, have his word in you. And these become part of the move of God in your heart where you can resist the devil and we can have him flee from us. The reality is many believers and many Christian leaders, again, they run shipwreck. As your pastor, it would grieve my heart if you ran shipwreck in your faith. It would grieve my heart that I never told you that the battle is real and you got caught up in a battle that you couldn't handle because you did not take it serious. It would grieve my heart as a pastor to see a marriage go sideways, to see somebody get caught up in adultery or fornication or one of the other traps of the enemy because I never told you how real it was. That the battle is real. There's an enemy that is seeking to destroy your marriage, seeking to destroy your family, seeking to destroy your faith. It's real. But Revelation tells us that there's an enemy that wants to accuse us day and night. Every morning, maybe you wake up, there's a thought that came out of nowhere. The night season, there was a thought, there's a stirring up. You woke up in the morning and there was hatred, anger in your heart. And you go, where did that come from? There was an impure thought, where did that come from? All of a sudden, something stirred up in you. There's an accusation. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Nobody can love you. You'll never get married. Uh, God has nothing for you. And all of a sudden, where did that accusation come from? That came from an enemy. He's an accuser of the brethren day and night. Revelation 12, 11 says, but they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We win because of the salvation of Christ and because of our testimony, our confession, saying the same thing that God says. We believe in the promises of God, and then we live selflessly. We serve God all the days of our lives. There is a battle. It's real. So Paul says, therefore, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Well, when you go to battle, you don't wear shorts and sandals. It's not a time of just sitting on the sand and just enjoying life. We, there's a battle that goes on. And to go to the battle, you've got to put your armor on. I believe we have to be consciously aware of the battle and then be intentional in how we dress. And Paul tells us there are five pieces of armor that protect ourselves and two offensive weapons. 
Now, we know the battle is serious. And I'm just going to run through these quickly, though, but I want you to catch the importance of what Paul has to say for us. It says in verse 14, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith and with which you can distinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. Five defensive, two offensive. And the two offenses are the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and then he says, and praying always in the Spirit. But I want you to understand that these two, the word and prayer, are tied to all five of the defensive weapons. Somehow the defensive weapons do not stand alone. They are connected either to prayer or connected to the word. And that's why as a church we cannot afford to neither be a part of the preaching of the word or of praying. We've got to be a, a church of the word and of prayer because they are what are connected so closely to Every, to the pieces of the uh, armor that we wear. First of all, the belt of truth. The belt just didn't hold everything up. Start running and all of a sudden the belt comes off. Guess what? So do all the pieces. The pieces are connected to the belt. The belt, Paul talks about as a soldier, he puts it on first before anything else because everything else somehow is connected. The belt, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the sword is on there, the shield, the shield, depending if it's a, a small shield that's connected to it or the large one would be resting on it to hold it up. But the belt of truth is central to, to you and I. And if you want any chance of standing firm against the schemes of the enemy, you've got to make first make a decision, listen to me, that you're a man or a woman that is committed to the word of God. You cannot be half-hearted to the word. You cannot say, well, I'll just pick out some verses that just make me feel good. You will never go into battle and come out victorious if that's the way it is. I'm glad you're in church today or you're watching online, but let me tell you, that doesn't mean you're girded in the truth. The church does not put the church on you. You've got to put the belt on. You have to get the word of God. You've got to get the scriptures. You've got to get the word in your life. You can study it, know it, and recite it, but it doesn't mean that you're committed to it. And I believe that to be committed is a sense, is a pledge of allegiance to the Word of God no matter what. That even if you are not politically correct, that even if society says, well, that, you're intolerant, and the world, world has words to oppose you, we're committed to the Word of God first. Because we realize this is God's Word, not the world's Word. We're committed to what God has to say. We, like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, which means the word comes first. It's a choice that you have to make to yourself when the tide of culture changes. When the, the systems of the world redefine the key proponents of what the word of God is talking about, whether it's marriage or, or uh, identity or whatever it is, we say, well, what does the word have to say? We go with the word of God. I believe when there's legislating new ways of thinking and new ways of living, we must be a people that don't just celebrate the Word of God on Sundays and we applaud the preacher, whoever happens to be there, we go, yeah, that's just so good. No, we become a people that say that Word is going with me through the week. That Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I am going to abide by the same Word that I applauded on Sunday because I'm committed to the Word, the belt of truth. John 17, 17, God, Jesus says, sanctify them, God, by the truth. Your Word is truth. Jesus said of himself, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the word. He is the truth. Jesus says that Satan in John 8, that he, he is a liar. He is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. The only truth is found in Jesus Christ. In Genesis, Satan's first words were, did God really say? Are we hearing that today? Well, God really didn't say that. He didn't really mean that. I mean, if we go into today's modern translations and look at those words, that's not really it. Don't worry about our church fathers. Don't worry about the first 1,800 years and how they translated it and what they understood and how churches were built on that foundation. No, no, we've got some modern people that can give us new interpretations, so we'll go with that. Did God really say and what we do is we take the word and we form it to our thoughts instead of taking our thoughts and forming it to God's word? Number two, are you guys okay with that? Breastplate of righteousness. 
Through Christ, we have been made righteous. We understand that. We're in right standing because of the cross. It's not our righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. But we are warring against this thing called the flesh. I don't know about you. And maybe you guys are all really good. You guys don't have carnal spells. Every once in a while, I got a carnal spell. I just go flesh. My attitude, my thoughts, some things I say maybe, all of a sudden this humanness inside of me rises up. And I go, where did that come from? How did that happen, that selfishness? We war against this world, against this, the inner man, this, this, this flesh life. We do the things we don't want to, and like Paul, go, who's going to save me from this wretched man that I am? Oh, thanks be to God. We turn our heart to God, and that's what we realize, that this breastplate of righteousness is so important to cover our heart. The belt of truth connected to the Word of God. The breastplate of righteousness is covering of the heart, covering of the, the, the thing that beats for Christ, for the ways of Christ, that pumps life and vitality to pursue the things of God. We protect the heart. Psalm 119, verse 11, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We cover our heart, the passion, the purposes of God with his word to keep the sin out. A soldier, a Roman soldier, when, he, when he's carrying his, uh, his uh, fatigues and his armor, it's about 70 pounds. And most of the 70 pounds is found in the breastplate of righteousness. Why? Because it's protecting the one organ, the heart, the life beat of the soldier, that if one arrow gets in, one tip of the spear gets in, if there's one rock that comes in and touches that heart, that soldier is done. He cannot carry out his purpose. He cannot advance. He cannot declare that Jesus Christ is alive. The kingdom all of a sudden needs that person. But we have to protect the heart, the organ that pumps life, passion, vitality, that gives you fervor and continue to follow God. The enemy says, if I can get one, it doesn't matter how long you've been going to church, you can end up a casualty. It doesn't matter how many times you can, or how many Bible verses you can memorize and tell me. It just takes one spear tip of the enemy. It doesn't matter how faithful you've been in your marriage, because it'll just take one, one attack of the enemy to divert your attention that you fall, and all of a sudden your marriage is gone. The enemy knows. And that's why we've got to protect our heart. We protect the passion, the, the desires in our heart, the thing that causes us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we say, God, I will not give in. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's so important we cover our heart. Number three, the shoes of the gospel of peace. You don't go into battle with bare feet. You'll slip, you'll slide, but you'll step on the enemy tactics. You put on battle shoes, boots. We're in a battle. You know, there are times that it's okay to dress up, wear dress shoes. Come on, we all like to look good. And today, yeah, you can wear your Converse and your Nikes out with dress clothes. That's all right. But generally, you put on some dress shoes, ladies. You, 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 you put on your high heels. It matches the dress you're wearing. Because, you know, you got to have shoes to match the dress, to match the, the, shoe, the, the purse, to match the scarf, to and earrings and everything, right? It's the, the ensemble. Come on, I know, I've been there. Not that I've worn them, but I have a beautiful wife that we love to get dressed up and go out. But the point is, you don't wear high heels in your battle. You put on army boots. You dress for the occasion. And Paul's telling his dress for the occasion that this is a battle we're in. We go, well, no, I'll put on shoes for fashion, not function. Well, that, that looks good going out, but I'll tell you, in the, in the battle, it doesn't work. You need function, not fashion. So we put on this gospel of peace, the preparation of the, the gospel. We, we, we put on because what good does it do to look good if you're dead? If you're unsuccessful, 
if you're a casualty. We advance in battle because of the gospel of peace. The word of reconciliation is in our lives and our mouth. We advance the kingdom because we share the gospel that changed our life. It can change somebody else's life. Peter writes and he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. Why? Why? Why do you have hope today? When everybody else is in fear and trial and trembling and, and shut in, what's different about you? Why have you got hope? Well, let me tell you, because I, I see these shoes I'm wearing, it's the gospel of peace. I understand the things of God. We're able to declare what the Lord has done in your life. You've got an answer for the hope. You've got the advancing power of the gospel in your life. Romans 1.16 says that the gospel is the power of God to, unto salvation to the Jews first and to the Gentiles, to everyone. Don't bring people and say, well, you've got to meet the pastor. The pastor will tell you all about salvation. No, you. You carry the gospel. You have the word of God inside of you. How do you defend yourself in the battlefield? you got the right shoes on, and it's so connected to the word of God. Romans 10, 15 says, And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? And as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I'm not going to take a survey, but how beautiful are your feet? How beautiful are they? How fragrant are they? Well, spiritually speaking, because there's an aroma that comes when you are dressed with the gospel, when you go out with the gospel. God, Paul, quoting out of Isaiah, says it's, it's beautiful. You got beautiful feet. Your feet are beautiful because you're carrying the gospel. And God wants you and I, as we go into the battlefields, we carry the gospel wherever we go. Then we have the shield of faith. Can I tell you, the devil wants to attack your faith your confidence in God, your trust in God, your unwillingness to say, God, I, I will never doubt you. I'll believe in you. And it's that faith that quenches the fiery darts of the enemy, it says. It's a shield of faith. It's a shield that you pick up and you hold on to to defend yourself. You have to hold up the shield of faith. It's not the pastor's job. I, 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 I'm, I'm under attack all the time. I got to look after my own life. My marriage, I'm looking after that. My family, I'm looking after that. Yeah, as your pastor, I pray for you constantly. But you've got to learn how to pick up the shield of faith and quench the fiery darts. That shield of faith would have a fire retardant uh, 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 element to it that when the flaming darts, the arrows would come, it would extinguish them and would not begin to set on fire. One of the tactics of the enemy is simply shoot up as many arrows as possible. A legion would shoot up their arrows and would drop down, and they were fire-tipped. Why? To set on fire the people and cause there to be chaos in there. The shield, we've got to lift it up. Our enemy will come with fiery darts, flaming arrows without notice. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there are some times where all out of nowhere a thought comes, and you go, where did that hack come from? Maybe there's a bitterness you thought was dealt with, and all of a sudden, boom, that comes up. Where did that come from? All of a sudden, an impure, impure thought, and you go, what was that? Where did that come from? It's like arrows. All of a sudden, the enemy's just shooting these fiery darts. You don't see it coming. He never told you, hey, I'm just going to shoot some dart, darts at you. You don't mind, do you? I'm just going to throw some thoughts your way and just try to, you know, deal with your marriage and deal with some of the areas of your struggles. And you and I have to be intentional about knowing that there are fiery darts coming at us and being able to deal with it. We lift up the shield of faith. We be, how do we, what do we do? We take the promise, some 8,000 promises of God in Scripture, and we begin to hold up Scripture, the shield of faith. We begin to hold up promises of God. We begin to declare the confessions that God has given us in Scripture, and we begin to push back like Jesus did in the wilderness and say, not today, devil. This is what I believe. This is my faith. And we begin to build up our most holy faith. Jude 25 says, build up your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. All of a sudden, our shield is lifted up, and all of a sudden, the enemy darts are quenched. But we need to have the Word of God. We need to be able to have prayer. In the Old Testament, King Saul, Israel's first king, all of a sudden, his heart was turned into a, a time of... Uh, Oh, disobedience and uh, just not following God and him and his son Jonathan went out to the final battle and they were destroyed by the enemy. And David, the next king, begins to sing a song of honor, gives a eulogy to worship. 
And in this song that he begins to cry out, he says of Saul, he says this phrase, he says of, of him, he says, his shield had not been anointed with oil. Saul didn't pay attention to his shield. He didn't oil up, as it were, with anointing the shield. We anoint our shield of faith through prayer and the word of God where we get into corporate gatherings of worship, where we begin to call on God, where we begin to yield our life to God, and our shield of faith gets strengthened. Some vitality comes back to where maybe you haven't been to church in a long time and your shield is dry, it's cracked, it's not really protective. You've been walking away from God and you're all of a sudden, you don't hear from God like you used to hear from God. There's not any of that desire to worship and you find that your shield just doesn't deal with the enemy like it used to got to anoint your shield and you anoint your shield in corporate gathering with worship and prayer and you begin to call on God you begin to down your hands and knees you begin to call for his fresh anointing on your life and your shield gets some anointing and you get confessing you get calling out with prayer and you begin to believe and begin to hold the promises of God when the fiery darts come and you respond because your shield is strong and lastly is the helmet of salvation we've got to protect our mind and our thoughts our mind has to be renewed when we come to Christ, our, our, our spirit, we are renewed. We have a new spirit. But then we've got that new heart, but we have the flesh that is constantly waging war. Then our soul, mind, will, and emotions is constantly under sanctification, under redemption. It's always being processed until we come to Christ. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man needs to be renewed day by day. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be pressed in, but he says, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Our mind has to constantly be renewed and protected. You can trace nearly every fall regarding temptation back to a single thought. It started with a thought. It started with a thought of anger, of, of lust, of some situation where all of a sudden a thought came in. And you follow the trail of a thought to a desire, to an action, to a fall. And, you know, we see this constantly in commercials today. They try to put into your mind thoughts that you never had, that you never needed, that car, that house, that new wife, whatever. But all of a sudden that thought comes in, and all of a sudden you think about that thought, and that thought then becomes a desire, and that desire becomes an action, and that action becomes a fall. It starts with a thought. And the enemy comes to tell you, just take a taste, take a nibble, take a look. After all, what will it really do? And besides, everybody else is doing it, and really, you deserve it. And all of a sudden, that thought settles down, and you rationalize it. Yeah, yeah, really, everybody else is doing it. I deserve this. What harm can it do? Hey, I'm the boss of me anyway. And all of a sudden, it just goes down that trail. Listen, if the enemy can gain a foothold in your mind and your heart, he has begun to move you down towards an area of defeat. Jesus said, if you even lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. That's the power of a thought. The power of a thought leads us somewhere. So what do we do? We fill our mind with the things of God, with pure thoughts, godly thoughts, scripture, worship, promises. You fill your mind so there's no room for the enemy to get in. And I believe you can either run every thought through the grid of the word of God. Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever is true. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Stop and think about what you're thinking about. Where did that thought come from? Is that a God thought or not a God thought? Because if it's not a God thought, then it's a thought that's going to take you down a path that's going to lead you to some destruction. Whether it's anger or bitterness or lust or, or maybe it's just some area of I want that thing or I deserve this thing or how dare they talk to me this way and all of a sudden a thought and before you do that you go hold it now run it through the grid of what God says what's his word say remember we're in Christ and our behavior has to follow being in Christ let me bring you towards the end here in a minute he gives us two offensive weapons. And the offensive weapons are simply this, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, but then he says prayer, praying in the Spirit, praying always. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I know we've transitioned from 
what we can handle to more what we can see, that it's in our new version, it's on our iPad, it's on our phone. But it doesn't do us any good to carry it in our pocket if we don't turn it on and read it. And the thing about a sword is you've got to learn how to handle it. You got to know how to pull it out of its sheath. You need to how, how to wield it. You need how to use it with your left hand and right hand. You need how to take care of it. Jesus defeated the devil in the wilderness by quoting scripture. But can I tell you, the devil knows scripture better than you. He's been around a lot longer than you. He's got all the memory verses. He's got all the little stars. I got them all. He knows them all. But you know what? Because he knows them, he knows how to misquote them and misuse them. He makes it sound right, but it's not. But if you're off just a small degree at the beginning, you will end up hundreds of miles off target. And that's why it's so important that you learn the scriptures. You will never discern a lie unless you know the truth. You will never discern a lie unless you know the truth. We are at wartime. We are at a time in history where there is more Bibles than bathrooms in a home. It just doesn't get used. We're more illiterate than ever. And I'm not speaking of this church. I'm speaking of general Christianity. Because we've lost the priority of the Word of God defining us as Christians. We've let labels and churches and social groups define. We've, we've used our activities and our benevolence to define us as Christians instead of the Word of God. But the Word of God is given to us to define us. The enemy will do whatever he can to keep you from reading the Bible. Listen to me. Words like it's archaic. It's not relevant. It doesn't really fit where our culture is today. It doesn't agree with my feelings. What I think of God, it doesn't really match up, so I, I'll go with what I think instead of with the God. And God says, hold it now. The Word of God becomes the defining factor in Christianity, not culture, not politicians, and not our feelings. It has to be the Word of God. In Mark chapter 5, verse 15, it talks about how when the Word is scattered, that it falls on hard ground. It says the enemy comes to quickly steal the Word so it will not have effect. And I believe we got today the enemy stealing the word. Where the word is going out in our conversations, in our life, and our preaching, and we're letting the enemy steal the word. Instead of taking it in our heart and putting it deep down where we grow and we become like that word. We need to grow in righteousness and godliness. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, meaning it's God breathed, it's a word for you. When we read scripture, we're breathing in his breath. When we're praying, we're breathing it out. Breath in, breath out. And that is the last one, praying always in the Spirit. Not some lay me down to sleep prayers. God, just thank you for today. Lord, thank you that I was able to feel good today in the warmth of the sun. And Lord, just really great knowing that I have all these things in life. Thank you, Lord. And amen. You will never shake the kingdom of darkness with those kind of prayers. We've got to have not lay me down to sleep prayers, but we need to have kingdom come, your will be done prayers. You pull down kingdom, God's kingdom down into your marriage. You pull the kingdom down into your home, into your children's life. You pull the kingdom down and you do warfare. You cause the darkness to flee and the light to arise. You get a hold of God with prayers where all of a sudden you pray kingdom invading prayers, military prayers, warfare prayers. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. Much happens with fervencies. Fervency, that, that passion, that zeal for the things of God. You set up protection. You become a watchman over your spouse and your family. You pray with confidence, binding and loosing, pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You get upset and you begin to say, God, I will do this. God, I will take on, God, what you're calling me to take on. It's like I'm not going to sit down or shut up. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight. We're in a war, so get out your bullets. Get out your bullets, your prayer bullets. Begin to pray target prayers. Begin to aim at things. Begin to break 
the oppression, oppression, break the anxiety, break the fear, and you combine prayer and fasting together because you know some things just don't come out without it. And we go, this is real. The battle is real. Every day you pray, you combine it with the Word of God. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you'll ask whatever you will, it'll be done. Presence, the Word, prayer. Put on the armor. You know, we're not born again with the armor. We have to put on the armor. But too often we don't put on the armor because we don't think it's really a battle. Oh, this is just fun. I come to church. How come that church split? Oh, that's okay. I'll just go over to this one. Oh, how come people aren't really pressing into the things of God? Oh, that's, that's interesting. I'll, I'll just float down to their level. And we look about and we go, well, that's just the way we are. No, it's not. It might be the way we are, but it's not the way we should be. It's because there's a battle going on, pressing against us. Jesus said, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That means that there's a work of the enemy that we've got to press against. The battle is real. Listen, oh, I can't tell you enough. I'm sorry to be so strong about this, but the battle is so real. Why is it that people, after so long, they stop coming to church, they stop reading the Bible, they start pressing in? Why? Because they, they became casualties of war. I don't want you to become a casualty of war. I want you to be victorious, to stand in victory. Therefore, he says, stand in the power of his might. Stand and become strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let's stand here. Amen. Let's stand, Lord. We thank you today for your word. We pray, Lord. Let this word not be stolen. Let it not be picked up. Let it not be taken out of the hearts of any person today. God, this is your word. God, your word to us, oh God, to strengthen us, encourage us. If there's anyone, Lord, God, that has been feeling the battle, I pray this word would, would become instruction to them. As soldiers go into battle, Lord, the general Jesus Christ speaks by his word and commands certain areas, oh Lord, that we can stand victorious. If anybody, oh God, senses they're becoming a casualty to this warfare, God, I pray, oh God, we gather around them. We are there to protect them, to pray for them, to put a wall of protection around them. We will strengthen them, oh God. God, we pray for the church today. God, there is no plan B. The church, the living church, oh God, is the answer, oh Lord, that this world needs. But God, we need to be those that, oh God, are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are pursuing the ways of God, that have the word and the prayer spirit so deeply entrenched in our lives, oh God, that we have victory. So God, we just pray for you to bless our hearts and our lives. Let us walk in the victory that you've called us to. And devil, not today. In our homes and our marriages, devil, not today. God, in our families, devil, not today. God, in the area of my own heart, devil, not today. We will stand against you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, let's worship the Lord here before we close. Come and consume God all we Give you permission, our hearts are yours. We want you, we want you. Come and consume God, oh, we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours. We want you, we want you.
tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet. Come on, we love Years ago, I read a, a quote from C.T. Studd, a uh, preacher, evangelist. I've written in my, all my Bibles as I made my way, and I thought this was just stirred me into taking this serious. It says, some men die by shrapnel, some men die by flames. Most men die, women, most men die inch by inch playing silly little games. When it comes to our walk with Christianity and walking in Christ, let's not play silly little games. The battle's real. God has great purposes for every one of you, plans for you, your marriage, your family. But the enemy will do what he can to deceive you to thinking that it's not a real battle. Don't worry about it. Just, just keep playing silly little games. It's okay. It's fun. It's all right. Jesus says, no. Paul says, no, the battle is real. Father, I pray for every person here today, Lord. God, if there's anyone right now, the Spirit of the Lord is convicting them about these silly little games, not taking it serious, that they're not really pressing in. The Bible reading is not really for them. The, maybe the church attendance and worship or, or just pursuing. God, they've, they've bought into a lie of the enemy. God, I pray for them right now, Lord, that by the Spirit of God, this conviction would come upon them that there would be now a change. Repentance, which means a change of mind, a turning of mind from going one way to another way. God, through repentance, they would go a different way, take the battle to be real, and they would come out, O oh Lord, victorious. No longer a casualty, but now a conquest. No longer, O oh God, deceived, but they walk in the truth. God, I thank you, Lord, for our congregation that upholds the word of God and a church that prays. God, we thank you for this bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Went a little longer today than normal, but we're finished the book of Ephesians. God bless you. This is us. Let it be part of your devotion life. Be encouraged. We'll see you through the week or on Sunday. God bless you.